Welcome to the Yours in Marketing Podcast. On this episode of the Yours in Marketing Podcast, I speak with Ethan Butte, the VP of Marketing at BombBomb.com. Ethan's on a mission to rehumanize communication through video. And really, BombBomb, which is the company where he's the vice president of marketing, is striving to help customers and businesses connect with each other on a much more human level. Video is a really practical and personal way to do this, to create those long-lasting relationships. So we talk about video strategy for companies B2B, also just for thought leadership and for personal brands. We also talk about what it takes to get into a role that you love being in if you feel like you're really not making a difference where you're at right now and what it takes to make that leap. Finally, we talk about his book, Rehumanize Your Business, and the importance of customer experience as a whole. He gives some really amazing insights as to how to run a business more effectively, how to communicate with your customers so that you keep them and retain them, but also as you're accruing new customers, how to make them feel like they're kind of part of the family. And we also talk about scaling that effort, which might be kind of a difficult thing. So that's kind of what you're going to get out of this episode. I hope that you'll listen all the way through. And at the end, we have a special interview with one of our employees here at Directive as well as part of the P2P, the peer-to-peer segment. So please stick around. Without further ado, here's the interview with Ethan Butte. Let's start here because you're heavy on the video side. That's what BombBomb does. So BombBomb's the company you're with. You're the VP of marketing. And it's heavily emphasizing video and rehumanizing businesses through a video strategy. So take me through what video, like why is it so much more impactful than any other medium? Why did that start speaking to you? Uh, that me- just video as, as a medium in general. Yeah. So I've been involved with the team for about 10 years. I've been here full time for eight years. And so we were pretty early to this style of video in particular, and we call it relationships through video. And the reason we did that is because most people think, and I'm sure most of the people listening now, when they think about video in a business context, they either think about scripted, produced, lit, edited, et cetera, for a homepage, right? And their point of reference is a television commercial or a film trailer. So it needs to look really good. It needs to be very intentional. It needs to be very perfect or approach perfect. Or the alternative is sometimes we think about you know, these personal branding plays, I think we all see it on LinkedIn where, you know, some people are doing it a little bit more buttoned up. And I feel like honestly, video on LinkedIn should be recommended for English as a second language learning because there's so many words flying around on the videos and all that. So we set relationships through video aside from marketing through video. And certainly there's a big area in between those two where there's some bleed, but The main idea behind marketing through video and the reason I'm so excited about and have stayed committed to this team and this concept and this community that we have is that it's about replacing some of that plain typed out text that you rely on every day. All of us do it. The same black text on the same white screen that doesn't build rapport. It doesn't differentiate us. It doesn't communicate as clearly as we do when we can look someone in the eye and just communicate face to face. And so we see this simple, personal, casual, conversational, unscripted style of video is a huge opportunity for really anyone in any seat in the house. We have all kinds of people using it, obviously not just marketing. We can talk about some marketing strategies if we want to, but you know, sales, inside sales, outside sales, customer support, success, and customer service, leadership, management, recruiting, pats on the back, thank yous, thank yous to customers, thank yous and good jobs to employees. Like anything that you're sending as a typed out text message or not sending because you just don't want to type it all up, responses to customer inquiries. There's just so many opportunities to be more personal and more human in the way that you're communicating with the people who matter most to your business every day. And that's what we're all about. Automation has kind of become the name of the game in marketing, right? Like that's what everybody's shooting for is to have everything automated. We want our income to be passive. We want everything to be totally set up for us. We do the hard work now so that it's all set up and we can put it on autopilot later. But that doesn't really fit with what you're saying. So how can we marry those strategies together, being more human, being more deliberate in our approach, but then also taking and embracing the automated part in an appropriate way? 
I love the question, and this is exactly the dilemma that we're all facing. It's not a dilemma. I guess it's a, it's more of a, a nut to crack or a problem to solve or how, whatever you want to, however you want to say that, because you can use video in an automated way. And we use video in an automated way. Basically, when you move from one stage of relationship to another stage of relationship. So for us, that's being someone who we don't know or isn't in our database, or maybe we have an email address because you joined us on a webinar or downloaded a guide or something, and you move into a two-week free trial. Boom, you're immediately moved to another stage and we trigger a sequence. Not all of them are videos, but some of them are. And so we have videos in some of those emails. And you use video again to have to create a sense of relationship, to communicate something that is maybe not that fun or easy to communicate in text or something that is easier to show than tell, like a screen recording video where you're maybe doing a little bit of show and tell inside a platform or a service or a counter. And here I'm talking software, but really anyone can do this. So as people move through stages of relationship, you have opportunities to nurture, educate, train, activate, et cetera, et cetera, whatever phrases you want to put around that. And you can use video in those. What you're talking about though, is really about when do we personalize and when do we get truly personal? And I think those words are used interchangeably. To me, personalized is when Netflix sends me that email that says, Hey, Ethan, you enjoyed the first four, first four years of the series. The fifth year is now available. Uh, Come check it out. Right. Yep. And I know it has my name in it. It is about a show that I've watched four seasons of. But it's an algorithm. Correct. And that's okay. I mean, we all, like, it has its place. There's no reason for someone from Netflix to pick up the phone and leave me a voicemail that says, (laughs) hey, man, check. Like, like, that's just silly. Yeah. Um, But we do also need to pick our spots for when we want to be truly personal. And truly personal is, hey, Jeff, Congratulations. This is your fourth year with us. Thank you so much for renewing again. It has been such a pleasure to be a partner in your business. Man, uh, you remember a year and a half ago when something happened, fill in the blank, blah, blah, blah. And in the meantime, if you want to click that link down below, it's it's just a, a little gift card, just our way of saying thanks. You know, take care, have an awesome day, right? That may or may not make sense for your business, depending on your price point, depending on how many people you have who are renewing for their fourth year. You know, if it's thousands and thousands of people, maybe it doesn't make sense. But, you know, if if you're in a product or a service environment where that fourth year renewal is a big deal and it makes financial sense, certainly that is a better play than just automating an email or automating a piece of direct mail. It's this, again, this is this human connection piece, this I see you, I hear you. I understand you. I appreciate you. You matter to me. And just like a handwritten note, because time is the asset, we were chatting a little bit about Gary Vaynerchuk earlier. He's one of many people who will explicitly say this, time is the asset. So just as as a handwritten note stands out to us and says, oh my gosh, she took the time to handwrite this note for me. It's the same thing with a personal video. And that's just one application of the personal videos to show that sincerity and gratitude. But there are a number of others like save yourself time by talking instead of typing, explaining something more clearly, blending that show and tell, et cetera. There's just a number of uses. But just to get back to the essence of the question here, it's when are we using personalized messages and personalized touches that are automated, smartly automated, triggered when someone fits these four criteria, boom, send this thing off or send the sequence off. And then let an account manager know that they need to follow up with a phone call on day six or whatever the case may be versus when do we get truly, truly personal? So something, for example, our customer success team does is after a lengthy or complicated call that maybe started with a a frustrated, confused, or potentially even angry customer, after the call, that rep will record a simple personal video. Sometimes it'll be a screen recording. Sometimes it'll just be a talking head. Just reiterating, thank you so much for being a customer. I hope that you got everything you needed here. It was a pleasure to spend time with you. And then you reiterate the couple things that got them excited. You overcome whatever the objection or concern or question was again. And you just it just reinforces everything that you spent together. But you do it when it's convenient for you. And that person might not open it up for five minutes or five hours or even five days. But there they are with a little moment of your day where they experience you as if you're across the table over coffee or lunch. It just leaves a different feeling. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. So like video is the closest thing to a human interaction in person, right? So like, that's why it's so effective. 
But what do you say to the people that take the opposing side of that and say, sure, it's great to be personalized to people. It's great to reach out to them. But how do I scale that? Because, you know, a lot of companies, they're really just about scale. If they think that their product's good enough and they can scale, then that's the most important thing. So how do those fit together? Yeah, it's a great question too. And I think it's a fair one. And again, it goes back to this, where does it make economic sense for you to do this, right? Because there is real time involved. So I will validate that. I will say video may not be for you. I do think pre-recorded videos is part of whatever kind of engagement and nurturing and congratulating. So for example, I have not done this yet, but I need to start a, a 100 video club, right? As soon as someone hits 100 videos in their account, we need to trigger a video. And there are enough people hitting 100 videos in their accounts that maybe that will be an evergreen or or pre-recorded. It's a little bit uh, redundant to call a video pre-recorded, but you know, just to, to get a sense of it, you record it once, use it over and over and over again as people hit that milestone. But when I make a 1000 video club, we've only got about a thousand people there and only a couple few people will hit it every day or every week. So maybe that's one where I personally or someone on my team personally gets it. And instead of having a canned video, because there aren't a whole ton of people blazing through that, that turnstile, Maybe we are truly personal there because it really matters and we say their name and we talk about where they're from and the nature of the business that they're in and how awesome it is and how fast they got there. And so, um, A, if you are all about scale and you are purely transactional, that the relationship and referral base play is almost exclusively in the product usage itself, then personal video may not be for you. You know, the types of folks that are really winning with us are the types of people who, A, have a price point or have a volume or have a referral basis that makes sense for them to have someone feel like they know someone at the company. I will caution anyone that wants to grow purely on, on scale and in transaction. I've seen a number of pieces of research about Gen Z, the pivotal generation, like whatever you want to call them. It's the, it's the newest entering the, I have a credit card or I have a, you know, I have a job group now right. and they want a sense of relationship. And so that doesn't mean you need to send all of them truly personal videos, but you need to look for spots to create a better, more connected experience. I think the more and more we grow and work in digital environments, the more and more we have a longing and craving and appreciation for what ultimately deeply at our core we're all about, which is human connection, this need to be seen and heard and understood, and this social nature that we have at our core as humans. Like there's a reason you and I have our videos, cam video cameras turned on right now. And it's, it makes a better experience. Now I think the podcast, because it's on the go and we don't expect people to sit down and, and watch this for 20 or 30 or 40 minutes or whatever, but you'll notice a lot of podcasts are now releasing the full episode on YouTube as well. Um, there are mm -hmm. a couple that I pay attention to that are doing that too. And so there's this, we need to look for ways to create connection with our brand and with our people, especially with the younger consumer in particular, but everyone appreciates it. If you reach out to someone and congratulate them on a milestone they hit with you and your product and your service or your company, it's meaningful. Definitely. You can correct me if I'm wrong, but I would say that the majority of businesses don't utilize video at all as part of their strategy because they feel like it's too time intensive, I would say. Most people, sure, they've got an ad strategy in place. They've got an SEO strategy in place. But then when we get into actual content creation as a means to connect with your audience and drive business, I think a lot of businesses see that as, oh, it's too difficult. I don't have the time to do that. With you personally, how have you found the time to actually create content that's meaningful for customers and for, your, for yourself and for the company? Again, I'll, I'll just restate this marketing through videos where most people go in their mind. That sounds expensive. That sounds time consuming. I don't have that in house. So I'm going to have to hire it out of house. I'm either going to have to hire employees that do that. And I've never interviewed and hired these type of people. I don't know what they look like. Um, I don't know what to pay them, et cetera. Right. So there's that, or I need to contract it out of house and that all of a sudden looks super expensive. And I worry about those things. I would say one, the good enough threshold is much lower than you think it is in general. Two, we do have a video guy in house. Now we have about 120, 130 people on our team. And I would say a hundred of us record video 
for some use in our position on a very regular basis. We do have a guy who comes to us with a video production background. And so when we want to do something that we know that thousands and thousands of our customers are going to see, we'll put him on it. We'll make sure we have the right person who's going to deliver that message or do that demo or whatever. And he might edit it and that kind of a thing. And so I think it is smart to start thinking about what does it look like to have a video person in house? And I think there are more uses than you would imagine. But I would also say I've, I send a newsletter to about 80 to 90,000 people twice a month. And I have recorded many videos for those that are just simple handheld mobile videos or even webcam shots like this one where I'm just standing at my desk under fluorescent lights with no special <laughs> equipment. Like, you know, it is, it is a nice $100 webcam. It's stepped up that way. It's not the built-in in my laptop. But the trouble people find themselves in is they think they need to have a video that looks like a really nice homepage video on a, you know, $100 million revenue plus company's homepage or they think it needs to look as good as a television commercial, or they think that it needs to have comedy. Frankly, these are all, we're lining up all the excuses to just delay the inevitable, which is if you want to be more effective at connecting with and nurturing and converting customers and making them successful, video is going to be part of that at some time. And so you should figure that out. You should look for those opportunities. You should be listening to shows like this where you're bringing on a variety of people who bring on a variety of perspectives about different ways to get things done and find the one that makes sense for you and your business and your business model. And where is the profit margin? Again, where do you go personal? and Where do you go personalized? Where you use an evergreen video versus where does a sales rep or a customer service rep specifically reach out to someone personally? When does the CEO send a personal video to someone that you've been recruiting at a mid to high level in the organization and send a video to that person and his or her significant other or spouse to like really get them excited to buy them into the organization to show that the CEO of this company is so excited about you joining that he took 90 seconds out of his day to greet you by name, talk about the opportunity, re reassert some of the things that we know you're excited about joining us, maybe overcome an, um, an objection, personally greet the other people that, that are important in his or her life to get their buy-in as well. Like these are simple things that anyone can do and it doesn't require production. And so I would say, look at your processes for attracting nurturing, converting, and retaining people. And you're going to find spots where if I could explain this more, like, where are you losing people? Where are the real problems? Where are the frequently asked questions? If you go to your inside sales team or your, you know, whoever your, whatever your sales organization looks like, you go to whoever's doing sales on a regular basis and you say, Hey, what are the three most common questions you got in the past week? They're going to have three of them like right away. Mm -hmm. well, I always hear about this competitor and they always wonder about this thing. And there's always this pricing question. Awesome. Maybe make videos about those things and have them at hand so that any salesperson um, can reply with those pre-recorded videos to address those if they come by email or that you can include them in a nurturing campaign in some way. I tend not to acknowledge competitors or competing stuff in a nurture campaign myself directly, but you might if it's a common one. Like if you're a second or third place organization and you're constantly getting like, well, you know, why wouldn't I go with the number one company or whatever? Right. If, that's, if that's that common... Take these things and answer them once and use it over and over again. And then use the video opportunity to make that eye contact, to be more persuasive, to use your full nonverbal communication, to create some sense of human connection with what is otherwise an email signature and a web page and these other kind of flat elements. Just bring it to life. And so we use a variety of our team members in a variety of ways. Uh, it's not just the marketing team that does marketing videos. It's not just the salespeople that send videos to our prospects. It's not just the CS people that send videos to our customers. We mix it up and, and we want people to feel like they know us. It's important to us. And, you know, our price point isn't crazy. You know, we, we're, we're anywhere from 30 to 70 bucks a month and we have 45,000 customers. Like mm -hmm. we found spots where video works. Definitely. Well, my key takeaway there is like we create these obstacles for ourselves, whether it's personally. So I've been through this personally when I wanted to try to create more content about marketing myself and put out videos and podcasts and blog, I started making excuses for why things shouldn't go live because I didn't think that they were perfect. And I realized, yeah, but 
zero is way worse than one. So if I did something, just a fraction of something, that's way better than trying to do a hundred things but never getting any of it done because I was too overwhelmed or too focused on making it perfect. There's definitely a lot of people listening here that can relate to that as well. But I want to take a step back because I noticed that in your background, you've got some TV in your background. So I, mean, I wanted to talk I want to talk about that and kind of how that has that experience has influenced where you ended up going in your career. So for me and this is a common thing. I've seen this theme come up over and over again and it's kind of like do you need content marketing hire a journalist. And so I did come up in local television. I came up writing, producing and editing spots and campaigns and, you know, cross-platform campaigns and then started running teams of people doing the same thing. And so I did that for about 13 years and it was fun. I enjoyed it. Uh, I was kind of uh, exhausted of it. Uh, one, you know, the product itself, I, I don't need to go down that road, but the product itself <laughs> is no longer like stimulating to me. Like I think if you're in sales or marketing, you're not a hundred percent bought into the value that you deliver to people every day that you're either dying inside or you're just disingenuous. And, and I don't like to feel either one of those things. So um, anyway, I was looking at other things to do. And it was the only thing I had done professionally was write, produce and edit TV and radio and cable and social and other online ads and things and campaigns. So fortunately for me, this is now like 2007, 2008. I was working on an MBA, which I finished, and I was also starting to do a lot of project work with other people. And so fortunately for me, I met Darren uh, Dawson and Connor McCluskey, our two co-founders. Darren was running internet sales at the NBC affiliate that I was at out here in Colorado Springs. So we met on the job, and then I met Connor, who was essentially his best friend, uh, met him shortly thereafter. And so I, I knew them. I didn't know that they were working on, on BombBomb at the time. They founded the company in 2006. But I was doing uh, landing pages and videos and email campaigns for them, writing a bunch of Google ads and landing pages for another guy, I did some video work for another company that was um, their HubSpot shop. And so they were doing work on behalf of their clients. So I did some video work for some of their clients. And so I was just doing all that to figure out what I really wanted to do. And I immediately, that combination of work combined with the rise of social, I immediately knew where my spot was going to be because I was very comfortable with video. Obviously I'd shot and edited, most importantly, edited and produced a ton of video. Like I have no idea how many, but hundreds and hundreds of spots, you know, 30 second and 60 second and 20 second and 15 second spots and a ton of short format writing. I had always been writing. I'd started a personal blog and I had always shot a ton of photos. I just always enjoyed shooting photos. So for me, social was perfect because I was comfortable with words. I was comfortable with photos and I was comfortable with video. That's how I kind of transitioned into content. So when they reached out to me and said, Hey, are you ready to do this full time? Because the company was at a point where they could make a somewhat competitive offer. I mean, I left a lot on the table, uh, you know, leaving a 60 year old company that still enjoys a 30% profit margin and still had a pension plan. I mean, my goodness, uh, to join a company where the healthcare benefit Man. at the time were terrible. I mean, now they're amazing, but at the time I joined, I mean, it's just, is really weak. So made some sacrifices there, but I knew it was the right thing. And I knew it'd be fun. And so my immediate thing that I did was lit up all the social channels, got active in the blog and lit up an, a video newsletter. And it was that process of just, as soon as I got into the cycle of, okay, I'm going to keep producing things and some of it's going to be product-based, but like, who are the customers? Who's succeeding? What stories can I share? what does a video email actually look like? And by that, I don't mean what does it look like in an inbox per se. I mean, what are people saying? When are they using it, et cetera, et cetera. And so I did that. Gosh, I probably wrote 500 blog posts and did a bunch of webinars and stage presentations over the course of four years as a solo marketing person. Like there was no team. And then the second four years of my time here so far, uh, we brought on our CMO, Steve, who's amazing, started building out the team. And I started turning some of these things into formal processes that I could hand over to other people. And so for me, television was helpful in that I was comfortable with video. And I had done just a ton of short format and cross-platform writing. So I could take it, what's going to be a three minute news piece, figure out the essence of it, knock it down into a 30 second spot where I have the best clips. I have the best sound, the best images, 
pick some music that characterizes it and you edit it all together. It's such, it's an art form. It was really fun for me. I loved it. And so this process of distilling down the best, most interesting, most salient thing lent itself to writing better subject lines, lent itself to, to doing just good teaching and training and also attracting people into that teaching and training. It was great for email campaigns. Like it was not difficult to become an email marketer. I've since sent millions of emails. And if you had told me that you were hiring me to be an email marketing guy, I would have been like, I don't know anything about email, but it's, <laughs> you know, the skills were all there. So I would say anyone that's listening, that's not, sh that's been doing the same thing for a while and wants to make a change and doesn't quite know how to do it. I just want to encourage you. You have transferable skills that you may not recognize. So if you're looking at job postings that look interesting to you and you're like, ah, I don't have that qualification. I don't have that quote unquote experience. Your skills are probably more transferable than you give yourself credit for. And that job description is a wish list more than it is anything else. If, if, if a company can get all those things they're asking for, congratulations. I wouldn't be intimidated to open up conversations. And um, I would also say just another use case for simple personal videos. We see it work on both sides. I already talked kind of a recruiting use case with that mock CEO to the, to the highly desirable candidate and his or her uh, family or significant other or whatever. But on the, on the employee side uh, or the potential hire side, sending a video into whoever's recruiting or the hiring manager, should you have that opportunity or privilege is a huge winning play. You're going to separate yourself from the stack of other people and be able to sell with your very best sales asset, which is you, no matter what you're doing, no matter what seat the job is in, no matter what you're trying to advance, what you're trying to influence and persuade someone, move someone from one position to another. And in this case, it's moving someone from not interviewing you to choosing to bring you in for an interview. And you are your own best sales asset in that process because who you are is significant to what you've achieved. That's really powerful because it doesn't just apply to even what you're just saying, but like in any instance in life, if you're trying to separate yourself, video can be a huge way to do that because not many people are willing to just make the effort to do that. But that, that example you gave of if you're a potential hire, sending a video to the, the interviewer, I've never seen anybody do that personally. So obviously that would stand out, right? Like if I've never seen it, if, if I've never really heard of that happening at my company, then doing something like that clearly will help you stand out. And then what's the harm in doing that? You know, you're, you're not going to hurt yourself by putting in that extra effort. But I, to piggyback off what you said a little bit, if anybody's listening here that maybe wants to transfer into something just a little bit different, but you don't think that it really fits, you gave an example there of kind of how you got into content. For me, when I got into SEO about five years ago, the only thing that I knew was how to speak French. I knew how to speak French and it helped me get a company uh, at a company called Boostability. And I had an entry level position on the French team with French Canadian clients doing SEO. I didn't know anything about SEO. I was not qualified for that job at all. I required a lot of training, but just having the one skill allowed me to get my foot in the door. And then I was able to prove my mettle from there. And so that's really sometimes what it takes. So if, if you are looking to get into something different, if you're not satisfied with where you're at, video is a great way to stand out along your way. And then also just look at those skills that you do have. And those can transfer in some way, like you mentioned. Yeah. And I'll give one more example. When we were looking to hire in someone to manage our trade shows, we do a ton of trade shows and conferences. We were looking to bring someone in full time to do it directly because it was like a shared responsibility across a variety of us. And it requires a really specific, like organized attention to detail mindset. And, and I have, like, I am an organized person, but that level of detail is just, man, that, it's a lot. So anyway, we narrowed it down to two candidates and one of them had done a variety of trade show type work, had produced events and had managed multiple vendors and people inbound and outbound in and out of a venue and all these other, like all the logistical details uh, this candidate had done many times over. The other person was a licensed therapist. She had a master's degree in, <laughs> in counseling and therapy, but you know, you meet both of them in person and we just recognized enough, like what would possess someone with a, a counseling degree to say, you know what, I'm going to go do this thing. And she's up against other people with the exact 
qualifications we're looking for. And yet there's something about that in person, who she is, how she presents herself, how she carries herself, the feeling you get when you ask her questions and get responses. Like these are the intangibles where I knew intuitively, it just knew that she was going to be the better person on the job. And she has been, it's amazing. This is like a year and a half, two years ago. And mm -hmm. she was one of the best hires that we've ever made into our team. And so anyway, I just thought that that occurred to me as you were giving further encouragement to people yeah. for possibilities. There's just another one. And that's just immediate. That, that person is 10 yards out my door right now. <laughs> and that's, that's fantastic. And I think that's the power of podcasting as well as somebody can hear this and that could change their whole life. Just that, that little snippet. So that's fantastic. I want to ask you a question about blogging because you've talked about how you've written tons and tons of blog content. You also have your own podcast. You also do video. You've got all these different things that you're a part of, that your company is a part of, but obviously video is just a more human way of communicating. So how can we make blogging more effective given that some of that emotion or the personality is inherently taken out of that content? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, you come from an SEO background, so you understand how important it is to blog and to do it with words that Google can understand and to put in the proper structure and hierarchy so that, you know, the bots, when they come and, and start looking at, you know, what's here, how good is it? And of course, there are a no number of other signs, including if people come to it out of a search that they stay on the post and hang around. There are all these things. People that are in SEO understand these things. What I would do as a habit all the time was write a full and proper blog post. And I, I did this both ways. I don't really have a preferred way to do it. Sometimes I just had a, a nugget of an idea or a cool story or a great pro tip or something. And I would oftentimes write the entire blog post and then just record a video just to bring it to life. And it'd be essentially one way to describe it would be if you don't take anything away, anything else away from it, take this away, right? Mm -hmm. Like, so I wrote this thing, you know, that I know what I'm talking about. This wasn't written by a bot or some, you know, contract agency or some anonymous people. I wrote this and I'm speaking about it somewhat extemporaneously. I would not script those videos. I would know what I wanted to do. Here's a, just a video pro tip. If you want to do a single pass video for an email or a blog post or whatever, but it's complicated and you have a number of points, go ahead and make an outline. Do not script it, but go ahead and make an outline. And then at the beginning of the video, if, you're, if it's eventually going to wind up out of frame, don't act like you're not working off an outline. Hold it in your hand or include it in the shot or whatever and introduce it. All. Hey, I'm about to show you or I'm about to explain to you three really important things that you need to know about fill in the blank, right? And, and then if you set it down and it goes out of the shot, no problem. They've already seen it. And so when you look off to, to pick up point number two or to remind yourself of point number three, it's not weird. People aren't wondering what you're looking off at. You don't have to mm. act like you're perfect. <laughs> you don't need to like, like you give yourself permission to lean on it and on, on a necessary and appropriate crutch, right? Like, and it's okay. It's just weird when you act like you don't have one. So anyway, I would know where I wanted to go with these videos and the one or two or three or four points I wanted to hit, and I would just speak to it. And so by the time you get done researching and writing the post, you should be very well equipped to explain why you wrote the post and what are the one or two most important things that, that someone should take away from it and or add a level of nuance or detail that is hard to write to or you know all these other benefits that video has but i think above all as someone who is is blogging you know you're doing it to help people you're doing it for seo you're doing it to create a sense of authority potentially any of a variety of things but i think as that last step of recording a simple not overproduced video that brings it to life and humanizes you as the author of it, it further cements the authority play. And not everyone's going to watch the video, but some people will. I would also say another tactic around this is, I haven't thought about this in a while, so, I'm, so you, you, your question is very <laughs> provocative for me. Um, <laughs> Good. <laughs> so another thing I would do in an email and in a blog post is give someone a reason to play the video. Do not use the video to completely reiterate what is already in the email body or is already in the blog post use some text around the video to tell people why they should watch the video and it should have some unique value in and of itself. The video and the text should be complementary to one another. It's just a few thoughts about video in a blog post. In some cases, you're actually going to want that to 
illustrate something you're talking about. So when we talk about a video use case, for example, in a blog post um, on our blog, we might either create the, a video like that ourselves or we'll find a customer example to share in there. That's another thing that we do is like, we'll use a customer testimonial video or a customer success story where they send us a video about how and why and when they're using BombBomb and using video and how awesome it is. And of course, that's a benefit to us, but it also teaches people. And then we'll get their permission to share a couple of their video examples. So, hey, Tom, thanks so much for sending me that video. Hey, in that video, you talked about using video in this way and in that way. Do you have a couple examples you could you could share with me? And then we'll drop in the exact videos that he used. And so it just brings it to life. It's funny. Um, we just had our book released. It released here in, in mid-April. I'm not sure when this is going to air. So we wrote a book on how, when, and why to use simple videos in your business. And it's called Rehumanize Your Business. And it's funny because this is exactly that same dilemma is, okay, the book, just like a blog post, the book is a great way to advance this mission, advance this movement, advance these ideas and philosophies and practices. And so, you know, we took all the things we've learned over the past several years and put them in a logical, sensible flow, packaged up in a, in a convenient format, whether you want it tangibly or whether you want the digital version of it, the ebook version of it. Uh, it's just a convenient package to take all this content that we've produced. You'd have to watch a webinar and a blog post, this, that, and the other thing. But then there's this irony of, well, you're, you're teaching people about video, but you're doing it with this, with plain black typed out text on a, on a plain white page. And it's the same thing in a blog post. If what you're teaching for us, of course, video should be seen and heard and, and felt, not just read about. Uh, so we built an entire companion website. So if you read the book, there are a number of call outs that say, you know, go to the book companion website with the URL to see him explain this himself or to see an example of her doing this. And so we do the same thing in our blog post. So if, if there's a show and tell element to what you're teaching about, whether it's, um, you know, a software feature or whether it is a how to get something done, how to connect one thing to another. You know, if you're writing a plumbing blog, for example, like don't just write about it for attracting people to your, I guess that'd be a parts and supplies blog more than a plumbing blog about how to connect things, but, you know, show how it's done and, and then give people a reason to watch the video. In some cases, the reason to watch the video is going to be inherent. Hey, if you want to see this done, click play. Mm -hmm. In other cases, you know, if it's a talking head teaching thing, if I'm teaching at the whiteboard or I'm just, you know, talking head, you need to give some a, a compelling reason around the video to actually click play on the video. One of the things that really bothers me when I'm looking at LinkedIn content or whatever is there are a lot of people that are trying to get into thought leadership, which I think is great to expand uh, the knowledge of other people, give it away for free. I love that mentality, but I see people just being kind of fake in a way and providing information that's really obvious that everybody already knows. Like how many LinkedIn posts have I seen that it's just like, you can do it, you just work harder and you'll get there. It's like, yeah, okay, but that's obvious. So I like your approach of, yeah, we can do thought leadership, but we, we can make a book, we can do videos, we can do these things, but how can we make it connect with people? How can we make it innovative and unique so that it actually stands out? And that's kind of the common theme that I'm getting here throughout talking with you so far is, being more human in business, sometimes it just boils down to standing out a little bit more to be able to do it effectively. But ultimately, it's just a really simple process. Don't speak down to people. Don't make them feel dumb. Don't be too obvious. Like, What are your thoughts on your approach to thought leadership and how people can do it in a way that actually provides value? You know, I think a conscious approach to thought leadership or a conscious approach to a personal brand, like I just can't get excited about it because it's so easy because it's a construction, right? Like if you stop and you carve some time out of your day and you go on a retreat for yourself or with some of your you know, other people and you brainstorm how you're going to establish thought leadership and develop your personal brand, like there's probably something useful there and I'm probably being too dismissive of it. Mm -hmm. But for me, my approach has been do work that is fun and interesting and challenging. Do it with people you like and respect and do it for people you like and respect. And you're going to inherently learn things along the way. And you teach those things, right? Like I'm not necessarily a pure adherent of the document, everything you're doing, Gary Vaynerchuk style either, but 
essentially that's what the whole, like my participation in the blog, which slowed down when I committed to start writing the book last summer, fall, I'm not in there as actively, but you know, my approach has always been as I learn things that I think that I know are useful to our prospects and our customers, find a way to organize it, make it interesting and fun to read and just share it. And so, you know, the truth is somewhere in between as it is with everything. I think you probably do know some things that you feel like everybody knows that everyone doesn't know. I teach this all the time to like real estate agents, right? We do a ton of business in real estate and mortgage and financial advisory and automotive and insurance and a number of these other businesses where the product itself is a little bit commodity. And so who you are and how you deliver the service is super important. And when they're looking for video content, um, that's why I always go to frequently asked questions. What do people ask about all the time? You know the answers to these. And because people ask you about them, most other people probably wonder the same thing or don't know, or the question has never even occurred to them. So I think as you run into something often in your role or in your position, or people tend to ask you the same questions over and over again, or you actually take a new approach to a problem you faced and overcome for the past two or three years in your role, but you found a new way to do it that's better. Um, these are all opportunities to do a quick video or to write up a quick social post and actually share something that is relatively new or novel to you, or you're wondering about something. You have a problem that you haven't been able to overcome and you would just want to ask about it. You can ask about that in a LinkedIn post or even in a video uh, where you characterize it. And so to me, I, I'm with you on, I think it's a, just a lot more, I don't want this to feel pejorative to the other side of it, but you know, it just feels more authentic and honest and approachable when you're just being who you are. And just having enough confidence that you are a competent professional, you would not be in the seat you're in if you did not deserve to be there. And if you don't deserve to be there, you should find another seat because the situation will work itself out, not to your favor eventually. So it, you need to have enough confidence that you are doing the right thing and the people around you trust you enough to do it. And the people who are choosing to work with you see enough value in what you're providing that you are a competent individuals. Therefore, you should have some confidence about how you're doing what you're doing and why you're doing what you're doing and let people in on that a little bit. I don't like, okay, how are we going to become thought leaders? I think you are a thought leader or you aren't, or you could be a thought leader and you're just not taking the time to organize your thoughts and publish them in words or pictures or videos. And so you may be undervaluing the fact that you potentially are a thought leader and not publishing on it because you don't have the confidence. That's why I kind of went down that alley. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I just, I don't like the manufactured look. I think we can sniff it out. And that would be my caution about video in general. And I'll double back on my departure from television to something I was more personally passionate about. If you are not sincere and excited and motivated by the opportunity you're presenting to people and the, and the value that they're going to get from it and the benefits that they're going to get from it. If you're not truly sincere and you are deeply transactionally minded and you're just looking to hit quota, video may not be for you because it's not going to be a winning look. We can sense insincerity. So just as much as you're going to win by being honest and sincere and direct and forthcoming and being who you are and being comfortable in your own skin. By the way, even if you have a blemish on your face or messed up hair, or you have five more pounds than you want to have on your body. And so you're kind of caught up on that. The confidence that you have in your own skin is fundamentally attractive. What makes you an attractive person is not just the way you look. It's the confidence that you carry yourself with. And so Comfort in your own skin is a winning play. It puts you in authority position. And when you can take the time to organize your thoughts and experiences or even questions into words and videos and maybe even into some images or pictures, you are in a great position to win natural authority in an honest and meaningful way. Let's talk about the book for just a second because that's not something that a lot of people have done. Um, has actually gone through the effort of putting together an entire book, especially one that is helpful and meaningful. So rehumanize your business. Let's talk about how many hours did you put into writing that? How long did that take you and Steven? How many late nights went into that? You mentioned you started last year, right? I got really excited. I knew I was going to write a book. And it's not because I've ever written a book before. I haven't. And my first thought was, 
it's going to be kind of the story of the company because it's been so interesting and challenging. And there were times that like, I mean, every milestone we hit, we defied the odds. And so, but then I thought about that more and more and I thought like, okay, who's the audience? Is it like young and up and coming entrepreneurs? And, and who are we? We haven't arrived. I mean, we've, you know, we're an awkward teenager, right? Like we're not an infant. We've made it to teenage years, but we have like, we're still a little bit gangly and yeah. <laughs> we have some confidence and we're capable and we're like, but you know, so it's like, it's a little presumptuous. So I kind of set that off on the side. And then when I hit my six year full-time anniversary, I started getting really excited about what we've done. I sincerely feel like we have built with, through, and for our customers the most healthy and accomplished community around this style of video. We have a thousand people who have sent a thousand videos or more. We have a ton of people who sent more than 5,000 videos and you don't send 5,000 videos. If the 4,999 before it were not a better and more effective way to communicate. And you don't send 5,000 videos if it's not quick and easy to do. And so I think we have something special here. I love our customers. I love learning from my customers. I love teaching customers. And so I just got super jacked about how far we had come just in the six years that I had been participating full time and all the stories and all the people and like, you know, almost all the customers I meet in person, like I'm kind of a hugger. I'm not a big, big hugger, <laughs> but I've hugged so many customers. It's because we feel like we know each other before we ever meet each other. It's just really cool. Like I am just so jacked about what we're doing. And when you get that video back from your customer that says, and this is going to sound over the top, but I've heard it a dozen times or more, man, this didn't just change my business. This changed my life. Like this ability to be more of who I am and be more personal in my touches and to get the more replies, but also warmer replies. So that's what got me excited. I was like, okay, we need to write the definitive guide to a better way to connect and communicate and convert every single day. And so I didn't tell anyone about it. Like I, I verbally committed to it to my wife and she was like, you should do it. She's so encouraging all the time. And, and she was very encouraging when I left a well-paying job to join a company that almost had no customers. Um, <laughs> and, and in theory could have been wiped out by MailChimp or Google or someone else miles back if they kind of moved on to the same idea. Mercifully here, they haven't. It's shocking. So she was encouraging. So I started writing it from five to six o'clock in the morning. And, you know, maybe the better part of a Saturday or a Sunday, most weekends. And I did that for a little while. I got to about five, six, seven thousand 7,000 words. Um, I had a full outline for it. Then I started sharing it with Steve, who was our chief marketing officer. We work together every day, even though he's in Philadelphia, we work by Zoom. And just to get a sense of internal buy-in, another big thing that I did was I reread books written by people I knew. And then reached out to them and asked them if they would give me some time. And so I talked with six different people I knew who had written books. Some had self-published and they're like that really lightweight, more pamphlet style. And some people had been published by, you know, name brand publishers. And so um, I talked about the two tracks. One of them is how do you actually write a book? And I talked to a guy who closed himself in a room and wrote for 12 hours a day and knocked it out in nine days. <laughs> I talked with another guy who took two years to do it, um, including like, you know, a month sabbatical. He's an independent contractor type of guy, so he can set his own schedule. So he just like forewent any projects for a while and like use that time and then just kind of chipped away at it. So, you know, I, I tried to figure out how it would work best for me. And then um, how do you get published? You know, how do you self-publish and how do you get a deal with a publisher? So went down those roads kept going, got buy-in from Steve, got internal buy-in because there was a question of whether it was going to be my book or whether it was going to be, you know, a bomb bomb endorsed project. And the company was super excited about the opportunity, especially because it's structured like a, you know, what is relationships through video? Why does it matter from a human connection standpoint? When do I actually send video versus sending text? Who is actually doing this? What does this look like in the field and how are people using it? How do I actually do this? How do I record video? How do I send video and email and text message and social media? And then some advanced strategies on how to get more email opens, how to get more video plays. What do I do if someone opens my email but doesn't play my video? How do I follow up if I do that for one person? Or how do I do that if I send it to a list of people and my video play rate's 20%? How do I get to the other 80%? So we go top to bottom. And so it's just this thoughtful structure. It was, it took me about two and a half months to write in total. Once I had kind of the, the outline down, mm -hmm. um, I did spend some time at my parents' place in West Michigan, where I 
you know, I still jumped in on a few meetings, was involved a little bit in operations, but, you know, kind of pulled the plug a little bit and was about 70% book, 30% operations and the rest of my job. So I did get some grace and help from some of my team members. So that was a little bit of a privilege and then just kept going. And the, and the crazy thing is writing the manuscript and submitting it to Wiley, like that was exciting. But that was just the start. You know, here I am now. That was, he said, if you give me a manuscript before Thanksgiving, I can give you a book before April is out. And and we're doing our first ever live conference in the first full week of May. So we're like, that's perfect. And it's just been not, it's just different phases of the same project over and over. Like, I'm not done. It's it's almost not real. Like I'm I'm standing here with a book right next to me. And yeah. It still doesn't feel like I have a book that I've written with Steve to celebrate everything we've learned with and for our customers. And because there's just still much so much work to do around it. So it's like I, I need to find better ways to stop and and celebrate the moments. <laughs> The book is called Rehumanize Your Business, How Personal Videos Accelerate Sales and Improve Customer Experience. Uh, it was written by Ethan and Steven. So Ethan's the VP of Marketing, Steven's a CMO. I'm going to get my hands on a copy. I saw that James Carberry got his copy. I was planning on ordering it today. So I'm going to go get it. But um, I'm, I'm really excited to read that. And then you are with bombbomb.com. So if you own a business and you're looking to kind of diversify a little bit, get a little more personal with your customers through email. This is a great way to do that. And hopefully you've been able to get some amazing insights from Ethan about how to rehumanize your business, do that thing exactly that the book is trying to teach you right there. Ethan, before you go, I have some rapid fire questions for you. Awesome. That will be a little more obnoxious and, uh, <laughs> Oh, I'll try yeah. to do it with you. <laughs> well, we'll see what we get. The point is just to, you know, ease it up a little bit. We've gotten really heavy on video and customer experience, and now it's time to just take a breather for a second. <laughs> okay, let's do this. Here's the rapid fire round. Texting or phone call? Texting. That surprises me. Okay, favorite day of the week? Probably Saturday. That makes sense. Favorite city in the United States besides any that you've ever lived in? Ooh, that takes Chicago off the list. I was going to go to Chicago. I lived there for a few years. It's my favorite city. Uh, my favorite city to travel to, shockingly, I hate almost everything about Las Vegas, but I like that it's walkable and there's good food there. <laughs> um, I love the Pacific Northwest. I love California. Yeah, it's hard to pick one. And you're, you're in Colorado Springs, right? Correct. Awesome. I, I was going to, as soon as you asked the question, I was like, Chicago all in. Yeah. But then you said that you haven't lived in. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what was the last song you listened to? It's a song called Grounded by a band called Pavement. I think it's her second album, but it's the re-release of it. And so it's got like that second disc with all the outtakes and bonus tracks and things. It was actually a song that was released on the album that came after that one, but it's always like a demo version of it. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I have an extensive CD collection and a very old car. So uh, <laughs> I still listen to a lot of music on compact discs. And it's actually fun just to like, I, you know, I have them in this cube and I just spin it, pull one out and I just ride with it for a couple of days or, you know, maybe even just a day, sometimes even a week. So I'm in like my, my second pass on this two disc set from, from Pavement, which is a really great American band. That's awesome. Would you rather be able to speak every language in the world or be able to talk to animals? Ooh, I'll say animals. What would be your ideal number one animal you'd want to talk to that you think would be the most interesting? I'm just going to say that things that are accessible to me, probably deer or birds. Uh, like we have a ton of deer in my neighborhood, like mule deer, and they just kind of cruise around the neighborhood and they seem interesting and fun. And birds, of course, just have a really cool perspective, but I don't know if their lives are that interesting. But, you know, to me, it's like, there's so many translation services. My son just went to Europe on a school trip and a buddy of his showed him a, a Google app that he could get where he could just hold up his phone and he could look at a billboard or a menu or a magazine or whatever. And it would do the translation live on his screen. So it would be cool to speak more languages. I think there's a lot to understanding cultures and personalities through human language, but animals are a little more interesting. And I think it'd be a more unique skill. I agree. Uh, finally, would you rather have invisibility or super strength? I think invisibility. 
gosh, that's a tough one. My, my gut is invisibility. I don't know why. I don't really want to hide from anything. <laughs> but again, there's kind of a novelty play there. I mean, there are people that are probably truly, I mean, literally, physically 10 to 20 times stronger than me, maybe more. Mm-hmm. So invisibility, I don't know anyone who's invisible. All right. Well, that that's all for those rapid fire questions. Uh, it was awesome talking to you. Cool, man. Thank you so much. And now it's time to switch from a B2B mindset to P2P. That is peer to peer. I'm going to be interviewing people here at Directive Consulting, my peers, my colleagues, to try to find out what makes them tick, to see where they come from, what their goals are professionally, and give you an idea of what the culture is like here at Directive. It's going to be a really interesting opportunity, and maybe you'll even find people that have your exact same job title, your same position, or your same goals, or maybe they just like the same music as you. So I've got Jonathan Verstegen here. How are you, Jonathan? Doing well, Blake. How are you? I am. I'm great. All Thank right. you. Yeah. So I want to start off by asking you about your story and how you ended up at Directive. So not like when you were born. We'll skip <laughs> for a little bit. How did you get your start in sales and marketing? And then how did you end up at Directive? I went to school for healthcare. I was an occupational therapy assistant practicing in a few different areas. Started off in pediatrics then went to uh, a skilled nursing facility working with older adults, but uh, actually grew up with Garrett Marigut. So known him since I was in first grade. We homeschooled together. Later on down the line in high school, I met Tanner, um, and then we actually became roommates for a short while there and uh, came pretty close. So I'd always been keeping pretty close tabs on Directive, and uh, obviously Garrett and Tanner were heavily involved in my life. So I uh, came to a point where occupational therapy I was getting a lot of fulfillment out of it, but wasn't getting a lot of hours from the particular job I had. And Garrett reached out to me and said, Hey, I know you're getting married soon. I can, you know, attest to the type of person you are since we've, we've known you for a while. Um, would love to offer you a position at directive. And since I had seen the type of explosive growth directive has been going through, and I know, you know, how much pride Garrett and Tanner both take in not only directive success as a company, but also the success of each individual within their company. It was, it was a no brainer for me. So able to hop on board. So you had no sales experience at all? No sales experience. Well, (laughs) I was saving up for a a bicycle when I was about 12 years old. And my brother and I would go to Costco and buy bulk packages of popsicles and then get on our rollerblades and sell them in the rich neighborhoods next door. So (laughs) other than that, yeah, no experience. And so if you were to stick in medicine, what what did you want to do long term? Did you want to stick with that? What were you already doing? Or did you want to get more education? Yeah. So I was an assistant, which is just an entry level degree. Mm. And uh, the plan was to essentially test out a few different practice settings and see which one I liked the best. And then from there, go ahead and get my master's degree and become a full fledged occupational therapy therapist rather than an assistant. And I had some sites set on maybe owning a home health practice or working specifically for fall prevention with older adults working on balance training and home safety assessments. But I realized that I am the type of person that really needs to follow under a structure rather than setting a structure for myself. And, you know, there's business owner personalities and there's people that perform really well within a company. And uh, I just was kind of faced with my reality that I'm probably going to be more successful as part of an organization. Um, And obviously Garrett uh, takes his leadership with fierce enthusiasm. So I knew that he was the kind of person I could definitely get behind. Going forward, do you see yourself ever going back to that? Or do you think this is what, what you want to do now? Yeah, no, and that's that's definitely a good question. I love what I do now, and I definitely see myself being here for a number of years. With that being said, maybe there's some potential for me to get back into that kind of on the side. I do have a definite heart for helping people, and I know that's something that you would express too during some of the earlier stages of your career, trying to figure out how you can rationalize, okay, I'm actually helping people. People need to make money. I'm, I'm making an impact on their on their lives. I know from the first podcast, so I know it's something you care about as well. It's definitely something that's that weighs pretty heavily on my heart as far as wanting to help people in real life and wanting to make sure I make an impact. So I can definitely see myself getting back into that as sort of a maybe a side project or something I do on an, a one by one basis rather than actually having a formal structure around it. But it'll be interesting to see. Yeah, uh, <laughs> life will take you where it'll take you, I guess. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but what what would your dream job or like your end goal look like oh, if yeah. you could have your career and the perfect way for you? What does that look like? Oh man, if I had the answer to that, I would be going for it at full sprint. Um, <laughs> I uh, Something that involves helping people and also getting the option to to golf a fair amount. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I think it would be, 
I would love to take sales, you know, as far as I can take it. But also I would like to maybe use some of this experience to go ahead and get more of a, a business mind if I do actually want to be profitable for something within the therapy realm or within just helping people. Ideally, I'm the kind of person though, money's always going to be kind of in the back end, right? Money's just going to be kind of the means to an end. And what I'd really like to do is just to be able to have a sustainable lifestyle while still being able to invest my time into helping people, right? I don't want to make my career be such a solid investment or such a, a huge percentage of the amount of time that I have in my life that I forget to focus on other areas or forget to prioritize other areas. So, I mean, it sounds like a dream. It's something that maybe sounds very millennial of me, but I would love to be able to have a lifestyle supported where I could just help people. Now, what avenue that's actually going to come from is yet to be determined. You're flexible. <laughs> yeah, I'm flexible. Exactly. Well, let's go back to golf. Since the Masters were on uh, the, this past weekend, be real. Did you cry? Absolutely. I cried. You cried. <laughs> yeah. And I, uh, I was taking a video because I wanted to show the world my enthusiasm. And then I realized that's not a normal person thing to do. Most people don't take a video of themselves crying at Tiger's victory, but I definitely did shed some tears. Is he your golfer or do you follow somebody else closer than him? Yeah. So DJ Dustin Johnson is, is my number one favorite, but I think everybody, even DJ himself was pulling for Tiger that day. Uh, <laughs> I didn't start golfing till three years ago. So I obviously knew of Tiger growing up, but didn't follow him super closely since his return. Definitely have been following him. And it's just a cool sports story, man. A cool human story. Definitely. That's, yeah. yeah. It's like one of the craziest things I've ever seen. It's amazing. He hasn't won since 2008. Yeah. It's been 11 years since his last major. I'm not sure how many years. Well, he won the tour championship mm. as his last just regular victory last year, but his last major. Yeah, it's been, it's been 11 crazy. years. It's crazy. I do follow pretty closely as well. No, but I mean, how can you not Yeah, follow Tiger? I mean, he yeah. like transcends the sport. So like Absolutely. growing up then, if we're talking about the people that influenced you or that inspired you, are there any golfers that would fit into that category? Or are there other people that Outside your family, it's easy to say your mom and your dad inspire you, whatever. Oh, but, you called me out. I was going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> but funny. like, is there anybody else that inspired you or motivated you to get on this path? Yeah. Well, I was growing up homeschooled, so I did have a lot of immediate influence from my family. Aside from that, I really wanted to be a professional hockey player when I was first growing up. I grew up playing hockey. I still play occasionally. In good old Southern California, ice hockey is pretty expensive yeah. and not as popular. So I do play mostly roller but I, that's what I really wanted to be. And Mike Madonna was my original kind of sports idol. Not sure that he influenced the path that I'm on today, but if we're talking <laughs> kind of loosely correlated to sports idols, Mike Madonna was my guy. Yeah, the Dallas Stars. And I just, I, I love the guy. He's just he's everything I wanted to be, right? He was number nine. I was number 19. So a little bit of similarity there. Mm -hmm. But uh, my uncle actually lived in Dallas and he, he was a pilot for Delta. And, and Mike Madonna just happened to have a spare house on his street as well. So I would always try to catch him, but I never did. But yeah, he was my original kind of sports idol. All right. So let's shift gears a little bit. If I'm going around asking your coworkers, the people that know you the best here at Directive, yeah. and I take a poll, what are they going to say is your spirit animal? I'm not asking Ooh. you what you think your spirit animal is. What are they going to say? All right. Oh, man. I definitely think they see me as uh, just like a happy-go-lucky, not like a rabbit because they're a little bit too scared, but uh, <laughs> yeah, something like that. Let's see. Spirit animal. Maybe a rabbit or like a kangaroo. <laughs> I, I don't can know. see that. Yeah, yeah, I can yeah. see that. Yeah. <laughs> like I got a little bit of hop to me, right? <laughs> Definitely. I think yeah. that's that's fair. But what okay. what would you say? So I, I do have a theory on this that I have two spirit animals. One uh is like kind of the elk personality, and that's my when I stand up for myself and stand up for morality and choose to be, you know, strong in what I believe in. And that's something that I definitely, you know, kind of the standard that I like to hold myself to. I feel like an elk is a, a symbol of like power for good. And I also have this other side of me that's like a black jaguar, right? That maybe I don't always make the best choices, but it sure <laughs> is fun. So I have those two kind of conflicting sides and they, they sure are fun to, to both kind of pursue. Who would win in a fight between an elk and a jaguar? Well, <laughs> hold on. Let's, let's rephrase that. 10 elk. Yeah, there we and go. One jaguar. <laughs> Ten, uh, it all comes out. They say, which one do you feed more? Right. But, uh, I think just head to head one-on-one, -on -one, definitely the jaguar. I think, I think maybe four, Maybe three elk could take on a jaguar, though. I always forget which one's bigger between a jaguar and a panther. One of them's a lot bigger. I don't know. I, don't know. I, don't I should have come prepared with scary. these answers. They're so scary. <laughs> They're really scary. I think it would take minimum two elk to defeat a jaguar. I agree with that. Yeah. yeah. 
if I was going to ask you, and I'm not looking for like, it's not an interview question of like, what's your biggest weakness, but rather if I ask you, what's something you're really trying to improve upon? Could be in your life, could be in your career, just the yeah. biggest thing that you think you want to improve on. Definitely. I think setting standards for myself and setting goals for myself because of myself, not because I've been told to do it, just because I know it's the right thing or because I know it's going to help me advance or because I know it's going to ultimately make me happy. Um, and having the courage to go ahead and move forward with that and prioritize that, something that I've definitely always been working on. I grew up, you know, my father's in the military. It was, you know, pretty strict, absolutely loving. I love my dad more than, you know, <laughs> I love my dad so much. love my parents, but he grew, we grew up in a very strict kind of house um, where I was always more of, okay, this is what I need to do because I was told, so I need to do it. So just learning how to kind of, you know, transcend that and really understand what, what makes me happy for myself and what's going to ultimately lead to the greatest good in my life. And um, whether it's something big like that or just at work, okay, here's the task I need to do because they're on my calendar, but really what's going to move the needle from a sales perspective. And if I need to go ahead and assign myself things outside of my normal day to day, how do I go ahead and, and start doing that and prioritizing that above just the medial tasks? Awesome. Love it. Yeah. All right. How good are you at hot potato? Hot potato. My goodness. I, I, I don't even remember. Are you ready for rapid fire? Oh, rapid fire. This one. I thought you meant the old school hot potato. <laughs> well, it's like, <laughs> it's like verbal and mental hot potato. Let's go for it. I talk pretty fast as it is, so I should be good <laughs> at it. Okay. I'll go through what I have. If I think of anything else, I'll throw it in there to okay. throw you off. But whew, here we go. All right. Texting or phone call? Mm, phone call. Favorite day of the week? Saturday. Why? Because golf and because uh, it's for the boys, but also get to spend a little moaning with the wife as well. Got to throw her in there. <laughs> Favorite city in the United States besides the one you currently live in? United States. Ooh, San Antonio. Extended family lives there. have a lot of good memories. Nice. I'm moving to Austin, so. Well, there we go. Yeah, it's close. close by. Yeah. What was the last song you listened to? Last song I listened to. Okay, I'm allowed to pull out my phone for no, the answer to this no. one. Oh, last Come song on. I listened to. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I listened to it. You know what it was? It was King's Kaleidoscope. They're a Christian worship band, but they don't sound like a typical Christian worship band because I can't stand typical Christian worship <laughs> bands. I believe it was called 139 was the name of the song. Very good. Yeah. Would you rather be able to speak every language in the world or be able to talk to animals? Oh my goodness. I got to say animals. I mean, right? Because I could theoretically learn every language that's possible, but animals is impossible. So I'm going to take that if I get the opportunity. If you could learn any language for fun, what would it be? Spanish. Most practical. Not practical. Let's do fun. Let's do fun. Okay. Let's go crazy. I like that. Just probably the most, whatever is, has the, the fewest people that actually speak at some random island in the middle of nowhere, <laughs> just in case I actually get thrown there. I think that would be really surprising to those people <laughs> that, uh, yeah, that I could speak their language. Invisibility or super strength? Invisibility. Favorite Avenger? Oh, you're not going to like me very much. Don't watch the Avengers. Ooh, that's watch. fine. No, that's fine. Is Captain America one of them? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. It's all good. What, what do you watch? We'll, we'll, um, we'll make it relevant to you. Yeah, I like Shawshank Redemption is a great movie. I'm just <laughs> I'm not a big action movie guy, to be completely honest. I like comedies. I like thought-provoking movies, and I like more of that type all of right, stuff. All right, so what's your go-to comedy? Best of all time. Dumb and Dumber is definitely up there for classics. Step Brothers, Anchorman. I feel like those were all part of the you know, Anchorman, Step Brothers. We're all part of kind of the last generation of great comedies. It's gone a little bit downhill since then. But yeah, Step Brothers, Anchorman, and, and Dumb and Dumber. Monty Python as well. Monty Python's great. Yeah. I think that, yeah, comedy is kind of in a weird place because like political correctness has made it so that it's hard to stretch the boundaries a little bit. So yeah, it's kind of an interesting space. And then you have the far opposite of people that are going shock value just for shock value for sake sure. with no actual thought process <laughs> yeah. behind it. Yeah. And I can't get behind that either. So cool, man. Well, that was Jonathan. Uh, he's in the sales. So what, what's your exact title? Account executive. Yeah. Account executive. He is really just like a, a nice guy. That's the only way I would just like, he's just always smiling and super happy. So yep. <laughs> Jonathan, thanks for coming on. Of course, it was a Blake. pleasure and uh, have a good one. Pleasure was mine. Thanks. Appreciate it, Blake. Just a reminder to please go check out Ethan on LinkedIn at Ethan Butte. Also on Twitter at Ethan Butte and go check out bombbomb.com as well as go to Amazon and look for this book. It's called Rehumanize Your Business. It's about creating personalized videos. It's really cool. I'm ordering my copy. I encourage you to go do that as well. And finally, please listen to the Customer Experience Podcast, also hosted by Ethan Butte. Thank you for listening to Yours in Marketing. I'm Blake Emmel.
if you would please do us the favor of subscribing to the podcast if you found value in this and tell your friends, tell other B2B leaders, tell people that need to hear about this. If you have a website, if you are in marketing or out of marketing, if you just want to learn how to build your website, how to build your business online, or if you just want to learn more about interesting people in general in the B2B space, please subscribe to this podcast. You definitely will get your money's worth because it's free.